Okay, so I think maybe we should start. We are very happy to have Alexei Borodin from MIT who will talk on geometry of dynamo. All right, thank you very much for, for the invitation and for the introduction. I'm very happy to be here. It's my first time in, in China, in Beijing, in Bimsa. Very interesting. Great suggestion, thank you. Right, um, and I, I'm doubly happy to be speaking in, in the workshop dedicated to Igor Kuchever. Um, this work is closely related to him and to his work and some of the things I learned from him. I wish I could give it for him, but maybe he hears in some way. Um, so the workshop is about integrable systems and there won't be any integrable systems for a while. They will show up, I promise, so if you don't fall asleep, I about 25 minutes into the talk, they will, they will show up and then in a very essential way. So the, um, the talk is about dimer models and I'll start by saying what the dimer model is, if this thing is going to work. And maybe it won't, at least this work. Okay, this I can do on my own. Okay, there we go. All right, so um, what is a Diamond model? One starts with uh, a graph, generally speaking an, an arbitrary graph, but in my situation they will all be plain graphs. And then one considers uh, perfect matchings of the graph in mathematical terminology or Diamond coverings in, in physics terminology, which is a choice of a subset of edges of the graph uh, so that every vertex gets covered exactly once. So these are two um, examples. They showed up in, in chemistry literature for the first time in the 1930s, to the best of my knowledge. Um, you can see the title, the Statistical Theory of Perfect Solutions. Um, they were very intensely studied for a decade, decade maybe in 1960s by statistical physicists, largely it seems in connection with uh, the progress in the easing model and, and, and related ones. Um, in 1980s, um, another group of statistical physicists suggested that um, the Diamond models may be relevant for describing a physical phenomenon which is pictured over here. These are actual photographs. You might not be able to see what's written here. Um, these are actual photographs of uh, helium at temperatures that are close to, to absolute zero. And the temperature decreases from top to bottom. And what happens is that um, crystals show up, they form, and if the temperature gets raised a little bit, then some of the faces of these crystals they become curved and they become much rougher. That one cannot see here. So these uh, surfaces, um, when they're flat, they're very flat. So the, the fluctuations from perfect plane are very small, but once they, they become curved and the physics changes and then they, they become much rougher. Um, so somehow these pictures have something to do with that and I'll try to comment on that later on. And then since uh, the early 1990s, as usual, mathematicians were late to the party and sort of started um, looking at, at, at these models, but, um, but I think found things that, that physicists might not have studied or, um, or maybe didn't care much about, I don't know. Um, so what is a dimer model? So I said what a dimer cover is. A dimer model for me is a way to choose a dimer cover with some probability. So the simplest situation is that if your graph is finite, you look at all possible dimer covers and uh, you consider them equiprobable. So each one has the probability one over the total number of, of dimer covers. Right? And then uh, 
this is a, um, so the typical thing probabilists like to ask is what a typical object looks like. If you sample one dimer at random, how will it look like? What can you see? And so I will talk about this type of questions for a while before we make a switch to integrable systems. Now, I will only consider one type of graph, which is um, a subset of a square lattice. And furthermore, I will consider only two possible subsets of the square lattice, both of which are squares. So this is one possibility when the square it has axes which are parallel to the uh, um, coordinate axis. And this is another possibility to draw an approximate square in the square lattice with the uh, sides at 45 degree angle to the uh, uh, coordinate axis. So this, um, this particular subdomain of the square lattice is usually called that stick diamond after Jim Prop, who, who named this domain about uh -huh. 35 years ago. All right, so the basic question then is that I consider a domain like that or a domain like that. I look at all possible diamond covers. I put a uniform measure on them. And I want to know what the typical object would look like. Can I say something about the typical object? Okay. Now, it's awkward to look at pictures like these. You're not going to see much. So I need a better way to draw them. And so I'll, I'll say now how to draw them better so that we can actually see things with naked eyes, so to say. So the first, the first useful tool um, is to note that this graph is, is bipartite, which means that we can split the vertices into black and white so that the edges always go between uh, a black and a white vertex. And then we see that um, horizontal edges if, if they're chosen as a dimer, um, they come in two types. They can either go from white to black or from black to, to white, if I look at them left to right. And similarly, vertical edges also come in two types. They can be either black on top or black on the bottom. Do I have that here? It's black on the bottom, right? So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to replace my dimers by the uh, um, surrounding domino. You see each dimer, so each edge of my graph can be covered by a two by one rectangle, which is like a domino that covers it. And so I'll do that, and then I'll, I'll paint those dominoes in four different colors, according to the four different types of, of, of edges that I have. Okay. Now please do ask me questions if, if they come up. This, um, I'll be happy to, to entertain as many as you can ask. I don't have a particular agenda to finish and so on, so I'll be happy to, to ask. All right, so then now I get a picture which is a domino cover of my domain, and there are four colors. Okay, so now it's better to look at this with naked eyes. And so these two domains here, if I take them of size 100 by 100, and then I sample in some way, uniformly at random, a random domino, Tiling, then I get this picture for the first example and this picture for the second example. Okay. I hope if you, this is the first time you see it, and these two pictures are drastically different. There is chaos going on here everywhere, and there is a very clear, clean color patterns in the corners. Right? So this is a, a face separation that, that occurs here. There, there is a so over here in the corner, you just get blue domino. So that means there will be a, a brick wall in this corner and in this corner. So there will be brick walls in every corner up to a certain curve inside which the chaos happens. So this curve is um, usually called an Arctic curve because outside of, of it, everything is frozen. And in this case, it's known to be a circle. It's one of the first results about the, um, the Arctic diamond. Um, so this would be the Arctic Circle. It goes back to um, Elkis, Cooper, Berg, Larson, and, and Prop. Now, um, this is better. So we can see that there is some difference between domains. There's something interesting happening. So I emphasize if probability is not something you're used to, this is the picture of a typical dimer. So you know, if you start drawing dimers, you can spend a million years drawing different dimers, and you will always get these corners. 
right? Of course, there are, there are also tilings here that will not have these corners, but the proportion of them among all is tiny. Okay, the proportion is smaller than exponentially small match. All right, so now I need another tool. So I want to actually view my pictures, not just like this. This is better, but not perfect yet. I want to do one more step. I want to lift my pictures in, in, in three dimensions. So for that, I, I, I'm going to switch to, to a window that hopefully has um, animations. So what will happen is that, so I have four types of uh, dominoes, right? And so what I'll do, I'll replace each of them by a three-dimensional shape. And what kind of shape I use, I'll just try to show. Right, oh, so let me do this. I'll just, uh, well, okay, maybe this is good enough. So I hope you see the three-dimensional object here. Right? So I, I took the, uh, the flat things lying in the plane, and then I lifted them into a, a three-dimensional, strangely looking pieces. And what's the benefit of that? The benefit is that if I now start with a tiling of an Aztec diamond, so this is an Aztec diamond of size four, and if I replace every domino by that strangely looking piece, then they will together form a graph of a continuous function. Okay. So you see that the, uh, um, the domino tiling becomes a bird-like graph of a function. And that's an equivalent language, actually. So this function is called the height function. And instead of looking at the, uh, at the flat picture, the domino tiling, I can be looking at these functions. Okay. And it's better because it gives us um, more suitable language actually to talk about things. Um, so here is a, um, the, uh, the Aztec diamond of order 100. So what happens if I lift it to 3D in the same way? And what will happen is that the circle will actually become a surface. Right? And so what this literally tells you is that almost all dimer covers with very high probability, once you lift them to 3D, will live in the in tiny neighborhood of the surface that you, you see on, on, the, on the graph here. So this is the law of large numbers or the lim limit shape phenomenon. So this has been known for, for a while. Any questions so far? Okay, I'll keep going. Now this model that I'm showing, uh, the Aztec diamond with the uniform weights, this has been studied to death. This is a, a, a deep model that mathematicians have studied for 35 years. And pretty much everything is known about it. You know, what, what do I mean? What? Well, that's a difference. So Andre suggests I should have said was studied to success. Um, that's also true. <laughs> but I stand by my formulation as well. <laughs> um, what did I do? Oops, wrong button. So as I said, everything is known about it. So I, I won't go through all the results, through all the things that are written on the board, but any reasonable question you want to ask about this picture probabilistically, you can answer. You know, Non-probabilistically, if you want to know the total number of, um, of domino covers of this domain, it's gonna be a clean power of two. You know, if you want to have a puzzle in the evening to, to solve, try it. it. It's not that bad. It's a very pretty fact. It's not easy to find a domain with the total number of, of domino covers being as simple as this number. But anyway, so you know, if you, you can zoom in in different parts of the picture, you can go in the middle, go in the lattice scale, ask for various probabilities. You can go to the edge, see how the edge fluctuates around the circle. You can look at the fluctuations around the surface. All is very well studied with, with, with very nice answers. The, 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 the edge is related to random matrices. The fluctuations here are related to the Gaussian, to two-dimensional Gaussian free field, conformal geometry, and so on. Okay. Now that's not going to, this picture is not going to be the subject of my talk, although I could have easily given a couple of lectures about it. If you have concrete questions later, please ask. I'll give references and stuff. Yeah. Uh, where is Bufetov? This is Alexei Bufetov, that's correct. This is, um, this is Bufetov Jr. Yeah. Um, all right, so if I told you already that I, there's only one domain I'm interested in, and it's already been studied to success, 
then what is there to do? So what I will do now is that I will replace the, the probabilities on, on the Daimler coverage, right? So I started by saying that let's just look at the simplest possible situation when all domino coverings are equally likely. So I'm not going to make them equally likely now. So how do I modify that? What I will do is that I will assign weights to edges of my lattice. And then when I have a particular domino cover, what I will do is I will look at the edges that participate in it, and I will multiply the weights of those edges together. And this will be the weight of my domino tiling. And some of them may be larger than others, depending on whether they use favorable edges or un unfavorable edges. Right? If all edges had weight one, then I, I get the uniform measure, but now I allow my edges to have different weights. Now that's too much freedom. I need to restrict it somehow to be, well, for the model to be possible to analyze in large scale. So I will only choose finitely many parameters. So I will choose a piece of my square lattice of size k by l, in this case it's three by four. So I will pick some positive numbers on the edges of that piece, and then I will duplicate them periodically, left, up, down, left, right, okay? So this gives me a set of weights on the square lattice, and then I get a way of biasing my covers. Some of them will be more likely, some of them will be less, and I want to know how the pictures will change. Does it make sense? Okay, good. All right, so here is an example. Uh, do you know, is there a way to turn off this light and not the other lights? Okay, thank you for trying. I'll, I'll, I'll keep talking while you do it. Oh, you actually, okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. This is, well, okay, my screen was not so perfect, so I, I prefer to have it sharper. So you see, this is no longer, I mean, there is still the phenomenon of separating frozen and unfrozen regions, right? So this is a, this is a sample, okay? Just trust me, it's a sample. It's a separate story how one draws a sample, but it's very clean. One can do it perfectly. This is maybe 200 by 200. And so you see that there are now frozen phases in the corners as before. There is also some curve that separates it. No, no, no. Some curve, certainly not the circle. And there are also strange regions that show up in the, in the chaos, right? So inside here, there is like a big chaos and small chaos. Something happens there. Actually, if one goes into 3D, remember the, the hyperboloid type picture I have, the plot of the, of the height function. So if I now do the plot of the height function and I look near one of these regions that look, you know, the star-like region, then one will see that the height function there is approximately flat. It's very close to being flat. This is a magnification of it. So this is the relation uh, uh, to the uh, um, roughening phenomenon, right? So what, what, th there is an appearance of a crystal phase that happens here. There is a very flat piece with very small fluctuations. Now, it seems kind of strange that I was able to achieve the new phase by just modifying the weights. And all I did, I just took the weights on the lattice, I took a three by three square, modified the weights, you know, duplicated, and there we go. Right. So this is a, a key feature of, of the model that actually makes it interesting. Okay. All right. And this is just a zoo of pictures. So, so you, you can see that these are different choices for different periodicities. So this is a this is a two by two periodicity. So two by two square with arbitrary weights, periodically duplicated. This is a three by three, three by three again. This is two by three, and this is another two by three. And you see pictures become different. They 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 change. And yeah. So it's a, it's a wonderful question. There are actually two questions in one. So one of them is whether there is a temperature parameter. And yes, there is a temperature parameter. And one can freeze this picture to success, to, um, to, to temperature zero. And that will actually make it so that the, uh, the crystal phases will fill the whole thing. 
I, I might comment on it a bit later um, in the talk. And the second question was about whether the, about the free energy. Yes, there is a free energy. And furthermore, the free energy in this case is going to be a function depending on um, the slope of the height function um, locally. And I will talk about it later. So um, anything else? All right. Okay. So the basic goal of my talk is try to explain that, that we, we know what these pictures are. Okay. So somehow we didn't maybe two years ago. Now we do. In, in more than one way, to be honest. So, and the message of the talk is that the picture that you see here, so maybe, yeah, well, I hope you see the picture, the colorful picture, right? So that picture is a picture of a Riemann surface in disguise. Okay, it's a, it's a strange way to draw a Riemann surface. Okay, well, with, with some fluctuations, fluctuations can be studied separately, but the low large numbers, the surface that, uh, that describes the, uh, um, the typical dimer behavior is, is a Riemann surface. So there is actually, so there are four in this, this is a three by three periodicity. So there are, this is actually, uh, the Riemann surface is, uh, is an algebraic curve of, of genus four. I will say how to, to build it a little later. And in order to go to this abstract, Algebraic curve, well, not really abstract, quite concrete at least, but it lives in, in the four-dimensional real space or two-dimensional complex space, just zeros of some polynomial. Now, in order to map it to the colorful picture with dimers, there is an intermediate, intermediary, which is uh, called an amoeba. It's a notion introduced by Gil van Kapana and uh, a while ago, about 40, 45 years ago, something like that. And uh, uh, this lives in the plane, in the two-dimensional real space. And so the way one goes from the actual Riemann surface or the algebraic curve to the amoeba is that one takes the log map. So one looks at the logs of the absolute values of the two complex variables. That produces a picture here. And now this picture, the flat picture in the, in the plane, is a one-to-one -one correspondence with my colorful picture. The ovals here, there are four ovals, compact ovals. They go to the four star-like regions over here. Now, this, um, the tentacles of the amoeba, so these go off to infinity. These correspond to the tangency points of the Arctic uh, curve with the boundary of the Aztec. So actually, the picture doesn't, well, no, it does correspond, but you can't quite see it. So there are three tangency points here, and there are three tentacles on each side. So the picture doesn't have enough resolution for you to see. And then the regions in between, so here it's a dash over here, and the, the more chaotic region over here, so there is a, there is a diffeomorphism um, that goes from one thing to the other, okay? So the actual math that describes this probabilistic limit here is uh, this uh, classical algebraic geometry, which is the, um, um, the algebraic curves. Now, the rest of my talk will be to try to explain in some way why these arise. And it's not a very simple thing. It would have been known a long time ago if it were that simple. But it's not too hard either. And integrable systems have lots to do with it. KL are the periods of my, uh, two periods of my fundamental domain. Yeah, so, so that, right, so that, 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 that's right. So if I had three by three, then I have to have genus four, so four ovals. Yeah. All right. Um, okay, well, maybe before I go into integrable systems, this is just a cute fact. So, so I told you that there is a, there is a, a a diffeomorphism between these two pictures. And so not only there is a diffeomorphism, but the, um, the, the slope of the tangent line under this diffeomorphism for the, for the boundaries is the same. Uh, this is color-coded. So you can see that when you go in this red thing going from lighter to darker, that's traveling in the Aztec. And this is traveling on the amoeba in the same color range. The diffeomorphism will map things with, um, I mean, points with the slope of the tangent line to points with the same slope of the tangent line. 
but the orientation will change because clearly the two pictures are different. So here you'll go counterclockwise and here you'll go clockwise. And so the tangency points here will become the, uh, the inflection point, well, the, um, the cusps over there. And that also sort of explains why the smooth ovals on the, uh, in the amoeba will become the star-like regions with four cusps because that's what will happen when you change the orientation of the tangent line because you're, you're, you're introducing a defect of four pi, twice two pi. You're rotating in the wrong direction. So you add two pi and two pi, there is a four pi change and that needs to get compensated by the flip of the direction of the tangent. Just a, a little bit of a, that's actually a proof that every, every domain, so every star-like domain over here will have four cusps. Okay. All right. Okay. So now, uh, yeah. Is, is it possible to think of this duality as proper to the garbage map? It, it, it's a serious set of duality of time. This is so not literally the, the oh, go, you go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, so now um, I will. Um, I could have skipped the next two slides, but I, I don't want to do that because the the upcoming talk um, by Sasha Babenko will actually rely on some of the same things as well. So it's not so bad maybe to, to repeat them twice. Uh, so the, how does one go from dimers to Riemann surfaces? Okay, so one path, which is a, a, a well-established path in statistical physics, is through uh, a variational problem. And that path actually proves that there must exist a limit shape or a problem like that. So no matter what boundary conditions you choose, you will always get this limiting surface that, that, that shows up. So now what, and, and that limiting surface is a solution to a variational problem. So what, what, kind, of, uh, what kind of variational problem am I talking about? Okay. So if I, well, let me take an example. So here is my limiting surface, my limit shape. And what I know is that in the neighborhood of this limit shape, there are lots of different possibilities for my height function, more than anywhere else, right? This is exactly the shape that maximizes the number of possibilities in the small neighborhood. Of it, right? So let me try to count how many possibilities I have in the neighborhood of some surface. Okay? So what do I do? I'll take my surface, oops, that's wrong. I'll take my surface, I'll cut it into little pieces so that each piece is approximately flat. I'm assuming that it's smooth and it's going to be smooth almost everywhere. Okay, and then in each piece, what I'm going to do, I'm going to freeze my height function on the boundary of the piece and count how many possibilities I have inside that piece. Because then in order to know the global number of possibilities, I'm just going to multiply them between the pieces, right? Because on the boundaries, they will automatically agree and then inside there is freedom. Now, because each, each piece is approximately flat, that problem is actually solvable explicitly. So that's, um, that's the question that I started with. When you have a, a, when you have a square in the plane with the sides parallel to the coordinate axis, one can actually compute explicitly the number of domino covers of this thing. This is the formula here. It doesn't look like it's an integer, but it's an integer. Okay, it's a, it's a discrete Fourier analysis computation. It's very nice. And so one can do it for, so the square, actually, if one goes to the height function, it has a flat boundary conditions. The height function on the boundary of the square is zero. So you're computing the number of possibilities with the frozen flat boundary condition. And in general, one can freeze boundary conditions with, with different slopes, and one can still do the Fourier analysis computation. So one computes how many things you have. Um, on each thing, and then you multiply them all together, and then you send things to the limit, you know, the pieces become tiny. And then uh, once you do that, you get a variational problem. So one, because you're multiplying things that you know, well, when you take the log, you're adding them up, and you're adding them up means you're integrating them. And so that creates a variational problem, which is uh, an integral 
of a certain functional on your surface. And that functional wants to be maximized in order to find the linear shape. So that, um, that, max, that, that principle will play a big role in, in, in the next talk. And Legendre transform and everything related to, to that. Now to me, um, I will only maybe say one thing here because this, this um, computation um, of the um, free energy of that functional that is being integrated it's a wonderful computation due to Andre in particular, together with um, Rick Kenyon and, and Scott Sheffield about 20 years ago. Um, and that computation involves the algebraic curve. Uh, what kind of algebraic curve that is? So here is a recipe how you compute the algebraic curve out of your weights of the dyno. So if you start with a, with a fundamental domain, then you put it on a torus. And then one introduces additional variables Z and W on the edges that intersect two particular cycles on the torus. And then one computes all possible uh, dimer covers of that graph on a torus, adds them up. This is going to be a polynomial in Z and W. Well, in my notation, it's going to be a Laurent polynomial. It doesn't matter that much. And that polynomial is, so if you equate it to zero, that's going to be an algebraic curve. And that algebraic curve is responsible for the asymptotic behavior of my Dharma model. It's not supposed to be obvi obvious or clear why, but that's just true. And I, what I wanted to say is that it's very explicit how to start with the Dharma model and produce that algebraic curve. All right, yeah. So then one could say, okay, so while you have a, a, a function also, why don't you just maximize it and solve some sort of Lagrange equations and, and see what happens. So that's not an easy part. You know the variational problem, but you don't know how to find a solution to it or whether there is an explicit solution. And so to find an explicit solution, we had to do something else, which I'm about to come to. But once the solution is known, there is a wonderful upcoming work of Nikolai Babianka, Sasha Babianka, and, and Yuri Suris that actually verifies that the solution to that variational problem is that, that whatever the formula is, it does the job. Okay. And that does not tell you how to find the solution. So if you go to other domains, if you change the boundary conditions, how do you find it? Well, I mean, you can try to guess, but that part hasn't been developed and it's not quite clear whether that's gonna be possible. No, this, this is the free energy. This is the formula for the functional. The exact solution is the plot of the height function. The, the, um, the exact solution is, uh, um, you know, for example, the, 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 this plot, the plot of this function. Okay. You had a complaint. Yes. Please. But I thought it's in the boundaries, though. In the in the in the periodic case, I don't know that. And you proved that in the uniform case, that's fine. But in the periodic case, I'm not sure that's exactly known. And you may be right. I agree that this this should be true, but I'm not sure it's a fact. <laughs> Right, so how do I construct the polynomial? Well, how, the way I construct the polynomial is I take this piece of the square lattice, I wrap it on a cylinder, oh, sorry, on the torus. You okay with that? We get a graph on the torus. And then I modify the edges, I modify the weights of edges, some subset of edges, which are here in yellow, by, multi by multiplying these ones by W and these ones by the inverse. This is just okay. the fundamental. This is the fundamental region, right? So this is a, 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 a three by four rectangle that's put on a torus and then modified along two cycles. Right? Then I can compute the sum over all dimer covers of that graph of their weights. I can compute the partition function. The sum of all possible dimer covers of the weight of that, of that cover. Now in each term, I will have a product of some number of Ws and some number of Zs. So that's gonna be a polynomial in Z and W. And that's the, um, the polynomial that defines the algebraic. 
spectral curve is immediate. This is the recipe. Yes. Anything else? Good. So now I'm going to change gears. Okay, I, I'm going to go into the integrable systems part, and I'm going to try to tell you the heart of the argument that allows one to solve the problem, actually, to find the solution. Okay. Now that has nothing to do with probability, so to say. That's the whole point somehow. You know, if one just uses probabilistic tools, they're too blunt to give answers to such refined questions. One needs to use something more pointed, and so. Integrable systems, in this case, help. There is, a, there is a part that I'm gonna skip, which is the relation of the uh, Diamond model to a matrix refactorization problem. So there is a path that allows one to map random Diamond problems in particular domains into something known as the Riemann-Hilbert problem, the problem of factorizing holomorphic matrix, uh, sorry, um, um, right, holomorphic matrix functions into factors that are, holomor that are holomorphic inside, say, the unit circle and outside the unit circle. So that part I'm skipping. I'm just going to the part where one wants to solve a certain Riemann-Hilbert problem. One wants to move poles of a matrix-valued function. One, one sort of wants to split the matrix depending on the complex parameter into two pieces where one piece will have zeros of the determinant inside the circle and the other one will have it outside. But now forget about all these words. So here is a question that one can ask a, a student in the first year or whenever doing the algebra. Take two matrices. So here are two, two arbitrary matrices. They have, so Z here is a variable, is a complex parameter. Alpha, beta, gamma, delta, A, B, C, D are just complex numbers, okay? So one takes these two matrices, one multiplies them, and then what I want to do, so, okay. So then if I compute the determinant of this thing, it will have a zero in Z corresponding to the determinant of the first matrix and corresponding to the determinant of the second matrix. Right? There will be a value of Z when the first one becomes degenerate and then the second one becomes degenerate. Now what I want to do, I want to write this matrix product as a matrix product of two other matrices so that the zero of the determinant goes from left to right. Okay? So I want to swap the zeros of the determinant. That's all I want to do. Okay. And for two by two case, this is explicit. Okay, here is an answer. And there is an X here that, that's expressed in terms of my original alpha, beta, gamma, delta, A, B, C, D here. It's a, it's a nice birational map. The problem is it's not bilinear. And what I need to do in order to solve my problem, I need to iterate this map many times. Really just two matrices two two by two matrices, and I want to run this thing many times. So what I do is I run this refactorization once, then I take two factors here, I place them back in the original order, I refactorize, place them back, refactorize, place them back, refactorize. I want to do it a million times, and I want to know the result that comes out. Okay. Now the beauty of it is that this problem has an explicit solution. In term, and, and this is uh, in terms of theta functions. And this is, um, so it's, this is explained in a, in a beautiful paper by, um, by Alexander Petrovich Vesilov and, and Jürgen Morzer from uh, um, 1990 or 91. And that's an offshoot, so to say, of the finite gap integration method of the uh, integrable uh, partial differential equations. And the finite gap method has been developed in particular by Igor Krichever in the, uh, in the early part of his career. Um, and he was actually, he was one of the key players in the, in the development. So what's the trick? So how much time? Oh, I still have time, good. So how does one linearize this integrable system? What helps you to do that thing a million times? And what helps it? is that you can change the coordinates on your space in such a way that your map becomes linear. You're just going along a straight line. And then you can go a million steps or you know, a billion steps, who cares, you know where you are. Right? What's that magic change of coordinates? So the magic change of coordinates is um, a very well-known trick, method maybe by now, first maybe it was a trick. One needs to um, represent the uh, 
the operation that we are doing, which I'm writing here. So this is my refactorization, right? I had my matrix polynomial, two by two matrix. I had it in the form P minus times time P plus, where minus and plus refers to different zeros of the determinant, right? Maybe, well, maybe one of them is inside the circle, the other one is outside. And so what I want to do, I want to put P minus and P plus in the wrong order. And then I want to refactorize them to put them in the right order, okay? That's actually a conjugation operation. So one thing you notice right away is that under this conjugation, the determinant of your matrix doesn't change. Well, that's I said before, you're just permuting the, the zeros of the, of the determinant. But not only the determinant doesn't change, the characteristic polynomial of the matrix doesn't change either under the conjugation. And so I can write that, the char that characteristic polynomial and its coefficients are actually all integrals of motion of my system. And by equating the characteristic polynomial to zero, I get the spectral curve. That's the same spectral curve that showed up in a different way from the diamond model. Under this map, and it's one and the same. And then, if I'm on my curve, the, 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 uh, so I have my uh, characteristic polynomial, so my, my P of Z minus W determinant vanishes. If the determinant of a matrix vanishes, it means that it has a null vector. So my null vector I'll denote it by, by psi. And so that psi depends on Z and the W. In the theory of integrable systems, it's, it, it's, it's known as the baker um, Achiezer function in a more, well, in a more infinite dimensional setup. Here, it's just the eigenvector of the matrix. That's all it is. And the trick is that under the transformations, what you have to do is that you have to trace. So this here is a, is a, is a vector function. So this is a vector of size two, depending on Z and W. So it's a two dimensional meromorphic function on the spectral curve. Is zeros and poles have to satisfy conditions known from 19th century, from early 19th century. And so one needs to look at how the zeros and poles of that analytic function of both entries, or one of the entries, doesn't matter, one determines everything, change under my refactorization. The key thing is that if one looks at these zeros, they will go along a straight line. Now that seems like nonsense because those zeros and poles, they they live on the Riemann surface. There are no straight lines on the Riemann surface. Well, I mean, there, there is, in a way, well, there are many straight lines. One needs to map the Riemann surface into what's called the Jacobian of that Riemann surface. There is a standard operation which, which turns the Riemann surface into a, a torus of, of dimension equal to the genus of the surface. And we, you can think of going around the, uh, the holes on the surface as, as periods, and so those periods will create the Jacobian, the map in the case of the elliptic curve is given by elliptic integral. And on that torus, on that Jacobian, the movement of the zeros will now become a straight line. So it's a tricky change of variables. And so eventually to get the solution to your original problem, you will have to write it in terms of the theta functions of that Jacobian. So that's a multi-dimensional theta function and all that. So that's not so, e so easy to plot Although, again, in the next talk, there will be probably nice pictures and also an explanation of how to draw that. And, and, and Koleba Benka here knows a lot about how to draw these beautiful pictures. Um, but I, you know, anyway, I try to say what, 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 what the idea is. Right? Um, okay, and this slide is probably just a, an iteration. Of, yeah, it's a little bit of more detail. So one looks at this null vector, which has two components normalized in some way. And then one looks at each of them carefully and one will, and each one will have two zeros and two poles in this case. And it turns out that one knows where the poles are just from the structure and one knows where, right. And then, the, and then there is a condition on all zeros um, poles of um, any meromorphic function on the Riemann surface known as Abel's theorem that they need to adapt to zero in the Jacobian. So there is only one free parameter remaining. And so one need to trace that free parameter and 
since one knows the behavior of three of the four singularities and one knows the condition on all of them, then one finds out what the fourth one is and that's really the straight line that one is after. So that's, a, that's really three lectures packed into five minutes, so that's not fair, but I just wanted to, to, to say what kind of technology is used in order to, to, to solve the, um, to solve the, uh, the system. Okay. Now, this is just a show off slide. I wanted to, to, to put up other examples where the same technology of integrating matrix refactorization shows up because it's very common. The, the QR, QR algorithm is, is used millions, maybe hundreds of millions of times numerically to find um, eigenvalues of matrices. When one starts with a matrix, splits it into a Q and an R, an orthogonal matrix times a triangular matrix. And then if you do, if you put them in the wrong order and then do the QR again and you repeat it many times, and there is a theorem that typically you will converge to a triangular matrix on the diagonal, there will be the eigenvalues because that operation doesn't change the eigenvalues. A very stable way of computing the eigenvalues numerically. And also closely related to the total lattice. Um, and the, the pictures here are billiard um, in, um, in, an, in, well, in an ellipsoid, I guess. So if you, if you well, this is a two-dimensional ellipsoid, but if you, if you play the game in a three-dimensional ellipsoid, I think this was the problem in, um, that motivated the original introduction of theta functions by, by, by Jacobi. And so that kind of um, um, motion a particular case of it is computing the geodesics on, on the Jacobian, because if you, if you shoot your billiard in the tangential direction, this will be a geodesic of the, of the, of the ellipsoid. And um, that was a very classical thing, um, and that, that's reducible to a matrix refactorization. And again, I'm going to refer to a beautiful paper of, um, of Moser and Veselov where this is explained. Um, and then the third example, I just did, um, one way of integrably discretizing the rotation of a solid body, the, the earlier equations of free body rotation. So this is really a very classical way of constructing integrable systems with exact solvability. And if you're curious, and you have energy and, and, and wish to study it, I, I, I really recommend it's a beautiful piece of mathematics. And somehow I, I learned some of it many years ago by talking to Igor and, and to um, Dubrovin, uh, unfortunately passed as well, but passed away as well. And uh, it basically lay dormant in my memory for about 30 years until it came to life in, in, in this problem. So you know, if you're intrigued and you have 30 years of your career ahead of you, by all means, learn it. It will, it will help you maybe one day. Um, yeah, and that's it. Uh, that, that's, I will only say that uh, it was a pleasurable thing to do. There are many possibilities to develop it because the problem is basically solved only in a single domain at the moment. There will be um, one generalization discussed in the next talk. Um, so the original result that, that I talked about was obtained, what was posted about a year ago, and since then there were two proofs that showed up that were different. One is, one, one is going to be presented in the next talk, so the variational problem. The other one is also a, a verification argument by Cedric Boutillier and um, um, Beatrice de Tillier, um, just posted maybe a couple of weeks ago. That also did not provide the derivation thing. So for now, the only derivation argument that exists is through matrix refactorization arguments that I presented. So integrable systems really rule in this case. Um, hopefully, as time goes on, people will learn to handle other domains. Um, we'll see. Um, but for now, this is all I have to say. So thank you very much for this. Questions? Yeah. Did you even say anything about the 
Alexander Petrovich said everything. <laughs> in, the, in the general matrix refactorization situation, there is a way to write um, the, um, the Hamiltonian instruction. And, and, and it applies, it probably applies here just as well. I did not do it, I did not have a reason to do it actually, but I expect that the same formulas will, will give an answer as well. I mean, the, the first integrals are just the coefficients of the characteristic polynomial, but if you actually want the, um, the coordinates, then uh, that hasn't been done, I mean, but it should be possible. Yeah, man. So I, 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 I don't know what chip, chip firing. So okay, chip firing is also related to the tropical geometry in the sense that one can get tropical curves out of um, chip out of abelian sand piles. But uh, uh, thank you for the question. That gives me a, a reason to find an image that I did not show. This is not connected directly to sand piles, but this is directly connected to tropical geometry. So what, there is a way to introduce a temperature parameter to the weights in this model. It's an easy way. You just take the weights and you raise it to the same power. Okay? If you raise it to a huge power, you will, either, you will get either huge weights or tiny weights. Okay? So you want to know what will happen when that power goes to infinity. What will happen is that the randomness, generally speaking, will want to disappear from your picture, and you're only looking for a maximizing configuration. You're looking for one dimer configuration that maximizes your energy, right? It, well, generically, it, well, generically, it's actually gonna be one, but if you start with a uniform measure, you, you raise once to the same power, you stay with once. So you need some genericity assumption. So generically, there, it's a theorem now that we are, almost done writing up, uh, that, that what will happen is, well, you can see, so this here is, um, is what happens when you raise all weights to, to a large parameter. So what happens is that the, uh, the curved things disappear, your whole limit shape becomes piecewise linear, and what, what's, on the, what's on the picture here is an image of a tropical curve. If you've seen tropical curves, tropical curves are quite different. They have tentacles and they also have convex um, polygons in, inside them. So a tropical curve is like an amoeba. So amoeba is going to converge to a tropical curve. But the Arctic curve was actually an image of the amoeba under some diffeomorphism. So that's the image under the diffeomorphism. You see that the, the uh, convex, polynomials turn, uh, ter convex polygons turn into non-convex ones. Um, and you get this nice tiling of a square by some, by some polygons. And uh, now you can look at the, uh, the three-dimensional thing. And so I, we, we do understand what that picture is right now. And it is a direct image of a tropical curve that arises by taking the tropical limit of the spectral curve. Tropical Jacobian varieties certainly exist and may be useful in some contexts. In our context, we actually did not need to do that. We could take the answer from the non-tropical case and take the limit of the answer already. We did not need to do the matrix refactor, the, the, the tropical analog of the matrix refactorization. Those certainly exist. There are ultra discrete integrable systems that pe people study like KDV. I didn't see it in the I didn't see the ultra-discrete ultra analogs of matrix refactorizations, actually. If anyone has, I, I'm happy to take, take, take a look. But the tropical finite gap is certainly being developed by, by people looking at something called box-ball systems and ultra-discrete ultra KDV and, and CODA and various equations like that. So that, that part of the world exists. I, I don't know it well enough, I guess. But in our case, we could be we didn't need to go to the Jacobian and the tropical case. We could just take the answer from the non-tropical and directly pass to the limit. So. Yeah. Any periodic weights. Any periodic weights. Three by three was just the example that I had. Uh, so. Uh, 
where is my PDF? Oops. No, I, I, I don't. I, I don't think it matters in this case. I mean, that's a, that's an interesting guess, but. Uh, <laughs> well, we don't get higher level. I mean, we we're in generic situation. The non-generic case is actually probably quite interesting because so the pictures I'm showing you are all under the assumption of of genericity. If, if weights are not generic, there are various coalescences that's going to happen that, that geometrically might be very interesting to study, but we haven't even touched that. I mean, that's it. No, 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 it worked. No, 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 this formula works fine. That's fine. You get two, yeah, two times two is four. That's fine. So yeah, to, to answer the, the question, this was a, a three by, this was a two by two case. This is a three by three. And, and one could, in principle, try to produce pictures of arbitrary periodicity, except for you need a really big computer to, to do it because it, uh, you, need, you need a large resolution to actually. Because you know, this is not just a picture, right? there are tiny dimers there inside the picture. So one actually needs to do that. The computer should be able to do the computation. And so I think 4 by 4 is still reasonable on 500 by 500 simulation, but higher than that, it's, it's becoming a mess. So again, Kolebopenko is a specialist. He, can, he, he knows how to do the computations well. Yeah. One of the weights equal to one? Oh, 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 you want the periodicity just to be in, in one direction. It's not too interesting. Well, you get a genus zero case, and that case can be handled by it's a rational curve, and that can be handled by the formalism of sure processes, the founders of which are sitting right here. So this is uh, Andrei and Kola, and and that 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 case uh, was known since 2000 or 99 or something like that. So it, it it's simplification, and it's uh, it's doable by the symmetric functions formalism. Well, yeah, everything is connected with everything. <laughs> I, I don't have a, a direct connection to offer to you, no. I mean, not to me. Maybe you can explain that to me. But. Yeah, okay. Yeah.